Hello, my name is Daniel Allenson, and welcome to my talk on the RISC-V instruction set, and why it isn't as risky as you think. So, what is an instruction set? It's, well, the set of instructions that a processor can run. In modern usage, there are two main instruction sets, ARM and x86 plus AMD64 slash there are many names. It's an extremely long-running architecture that's, be, that's had several extensions applied to it. AMD, uh, yeah, x86 is the architecture you'll find in desktop or laptop, pro or most laptop processors. Whereas ARM you'll find in basically anything that has a computer chip, if it has a microcontroller in it, that will use an ARM instruction set. Compared to these, RISC-V is a lot more recent and has not achieved the same level of adoption yet. There are two main kinds of modern instruction set. Reduced instruction set computers, or RISC, and complex instruction set computers, or CISC. x86 is, an, is the best example of the latter I can give. It has a lot of very specific instructions. For example, Take this instruction, PCMP DTW, which is sort for Act Compare Greater Than Signed Words. As for what this means, I have no clue. Uh, the reduced instruction set computer, on the other hand, has fewer, more general instructions. So, you'd have, is the item in register X less than the item in register Y? And you would have, wouldn't really have another method of comparing those, of comparing two values. You'd have to do it on those operations in those registers. So RISC-V, an instruction set, first began back in May of 2010. Um, and it's an entirely free instruction set in that the specification is out on GitHub and on the website under the Creative Commons under a Creative Commons license, and it is entirely free to download it and use it to design your own CPUs. And you don't have to pay any licensing fees to the Risk Five Foundation. With ARM, you need to pay licensing fees to ARM, and for x86, you need to pay them to Intel and AMD. Now, Risk Five on its own is not an instruction set. It's a family of instruction sets. So you're not going to be able to find a processor running RISC-V specifically. You would find one running, say, RV64DC or RV32IMAC or RV32E. And each RISC-V instruction set consists of a so-called base ISA or base instruction set architecture and several and zero or more optional extensions. So for example, if you wanted compressed instructions, you would have the C extension. If you wanted ha uh, hardware float support, you would install, the, you would have the F extension. If you wanted hardware doubles, you would have the D extension. And extensions can depend on other extensions. So for example, if you want hardware double support with extension D, you would also need extension F. Now, in this five, there are four of these base instruction sets you can use. RV32i, RV32e, RV64i, and RV128i. And now, this number in the name specifies what's called XLEN, which is the length of the registers in them. So, RV32i and 32e have 32-bit registers, RV64i has 64-bit, and RV128i has 128 bit registers. This also specifies the size of the address space and the words they operate on. So RV64i can operate on 2 to 64 bytes of memory and operates on so called 64 bit double words. The easiest one of these to focus on will be RV128i because it's not actually defined in the risk five specification. This is because no computer currently needs 128 bits of address space. Um, so it'd be a bit pointless to define this. 
until we have a computer that actually needs 128 bits in it um, of address space. Um, because the specification might be designed in a way that doesn't actually work for these. So for now, it's in the specification, um, but it remains essentially undefined until we have experience working with these kinds of computer. The next easiest instruction set to focus on is RV32i, because all of the others essentially build off of this in a sense. Any code written for RV32i will also work on RV64i, for example. It can operate on, of course, up to 2 to the 32 bytes of memory, because, again, it's excellent, it's 32, 32 bits. So again, operates on 32-bit words, and it has 32 32-bit registers. Every one of the base instruction sets has 32 integer registers. It's just their length that changes. Now, these registers are named from x0 to x31, and their length, again, depends on the xlen of the base instruction set. These don't have to be referred to by these names. They can have aliases. So, for example, um, by default, Inspect recommends that X2 is used as a stack pointer. And so, therefore, that has the alias SP. Um, the X0 register is special. It's read only, so you can't write to it, and it will always read 0. So, this has the alias of 0, Z E R 0, Z E R O. It's also a special extra register, the program counter, is also xlen bits long and it's used to store the address of the current instruction. You can't address it with um, any instruction except for those that specifically can address the program counter, but it's still a register that exists, just not one of the general purpose registers. Now what if you want to move a value from one register to another? In x86, you have a wide range of move instructions you can choose. Um, and these can also have different encodings. In fact, the x86 move instruction has so many different encodings that do so many things that it is Turing complete and a version of Doom exists that consists only of x86 move instructions. It takes about seven hours to render one frame though, so as its GitHub page states, you, you need a bit of patience to play it. Meanwhile, in risc 5 you have a far fewer move instructions. In fact, most of the ones listed here float specific and are really concluded to have parity with that list on the previous page. The only one that is relevant for the base instruction sets is the top one. MV. And um, this instruction also doesn't particularly exist. In a special case of one of the add instructions, and we'll come back to that later, but this brings us on to a good point, which is the encodings of the different instructions. Now, in RISC 5, there were four base instruction sets. Instruction encodings, the R type, the I type, the S type, and the U type. R is for instructions that operate on two different registers. I is for instructions that operate on one register and an immediate. So the R type is the register to register type, and the I type is the immediate type. S is for the store instructions, since S for store. And U is for instructions that use the upper bit of an immediate, hence U type for upper immediate instructions. There are also two extra variants we can cover here. So the B or branch type is used for branch instructions, and the J or jump type is used for jump instructions. These are mostly, B is mostly the same as S, but with the immediate rearranged. And J is mostly the same as U, but again, with the immediate rearranged. This diagram from Wikipedia hopefully shows it in a way that's a bit more easier to understand, with some colour added. Um, 
So here, the green registers represent the source registers. So if you have two source registers, this is how you would, um, that's where they're addressed. And as you can have up to 32 registers, you would use five bits to represent the specific register you're talking about. And obviously you have to store the result of your instructions. So that's what RD in red, the destination register, is for. Um, and let's point this out. Every instruction in RISC five is a multiple of thirty of sixteen bits or two bytes long. You can have an instruction that's two bytes long, you can have an instruction that's four bytes long, but you can't have one that is three bytes long. Um, anyway, back to the instructions. You will also note the opcode field on the right. This doesn't specify a specific instruction, it specifies a class of instruction. The specific instruction is then represented using the funct bits, so funct3 from bits 14 to 12 for the instruction, and in the case of register register instructions, funct7 from bits 31 to 25 of the instruction. And um, the readers part you may notice is just the layout of some of the immediates. Take so the jump immediate, for example. This appears to go all over the place. The most significant bit is at bit 31 of the instruction. Then you go down to bits 19 to 12 of the instruction and back up to bits 30 to 21 of the instruction and then down to bit 20. So, why is this? This is actually a really clever bit of instruction set design and it massively simplifies the decoding of the instruction. Take, for example, you want to determine the sign of the bit. You have to look at the most significant bit of the instruction and this is always at bit 31 of the instruction. And this is true for all five of the ones with immediates. That's why it's placed there. But then why is the rest of the immediate so jumbled around? This is again to simplify decoding. So for example, the jump and the upper immediate both have bits 19 to 12 of their immediate in bits 19 to 12 of the instruction. And this massively simplifies decoding as you can just reuse the same circuitry. Like, well, likewise, the jump and yeah, the jump, branch, store, and immediate ones all have bits 10 to 5 of their immediates in bits 30 to 25 of the instruction. This means the same bit of circuitry can be reused for all of these and it makes it so much easier to be decoded. However, not all instructions are 32 bits long. So, how do you tell how long an instruction is? Well, as you can see in this chart, you don't have to check the entire instruction and try and decode it. You only have to check a few of the bits. If it's a 16-bit instruction, um, there are only a couple of bits. Um, yeah, there are on you only have to check a couple of bits. If the first two bits are not both one, it's a 16-bit instruction. And then and the same process repeats for 32 bit, etc. etc. And this also goes back to instruction set encodings. For example, for instructions between 64 and 192 bits long, you ha first have a string of ones and then a gap of five bits. Well, this string of ones is the opcode, and then that gap of five bits is in the same position as the destination register as I was referring to on the previous slide. And then those next three bits would be func3. This again, it massively simplifies decoding and it's a really clever bit of design. You don't have to read and decode the entire instruction. You only have to read a certain small number of bits. Now, you can specify custom extensions, which is where this really comes in useful. But custom extensions generally won't have um, instructions that are 16 bits long, 
as this address space is used by the C extension. So if you have a processor that didn't implement the C extension, there's no reason you couldn't have this. Now, one of the instruction format is, of course, the immediate instructions. So these are instructions that, in addition to operating on a register, also operate on an immediate value encoded in the instruction itself. Um, and there are many of them, as you can see here. Um, but the one I'm going to focus on in particular is the add immediate or add i instruction. This is special because it's actually how the MV instruction I referenced earlier is defined. MV is just a special case of the add i instruction where the immediate value is zero. So nothing gets added and the value from the first register gets stored in the second register. It's a move instruction and it functions like one, but no addition actually happens because you're adding zero, so it's a move. You've also got the no-op instruction, which is also a special case of add immediate. You'll also notice that the op code here is op IMM. It's used to define several instructions, so as soon as you read that op code, you know that you're going to be operating on an immediate value. The next class of instructions, as you can see here, are the upper immediate instructions, which use the U instruction type. Um, they take an immediate value, pad the rest of the bits with zeros, and store it in a resultant value. Load up immediate is used to make really big constants. So if you need a 32-bit constant, this is how you do it. And you could say, use an add as well as an add immediate. You could use an add immediate to fill out that 32-bit constant. AUIPC adds the up immediate you've been given to the um, to value in the program counter and stores that in RD. So you can get offsets from the current program counter. Um, and next you have the register to register instructions. These will, these are pretty similar in what they do to the immediate instructions. However, instead of operating on a register and an immediate value, they operate on two registers. And this is another really clever bit of design of the instruction set. Because every instruction only reads from two registers and writes to a third register in the instruction set. There are some exceptions, for example, the float instruction set has some instructions that read from three float registers. But in the base integer instruction sets, you only read from two and write for, to one register in the instruction. And this is clever because it allows you to use so-called dual port memories for your register files. And that massively simplifies the design, especially in, say, smaller microcontrollers. Um, so yeah, that makes it a lot easier to work with. Next, we have the jump instructions, which use the J encoding. Both of these work pretty similarly. They're used for when you need to unconditionally jump to another part of the program, say, a function, for example. Then they both store the address of the instruction after the current instruction into RD, so it's possible to return from them. JAL adds the off the immediate to the value in the program counter and jumps to that instruction, whereas JLR jumps, adds the immediate to the value in RS1 and jumps to that instruction. Next to the branch instructions, which obviously is the branch, or B, encoding. These are used for conditional jumps. So, for example, your if statements will use branches. These don't store the return address, um, unlike the jump instructions. Instead, they take the immediate value add it to the value in the program counter and 
if the um, values in the registers RS2 and RS1 satisfy the condition of this specific branch instruction, you'll jump to that address. Um, you'll note that it doesn't have, this five doesn't have, say, a branch greater than instruction. However, it does have a branch less than instruction. So if you want branch greater than, you should just swap RS1 and RS2, and you've synthesized a branch greater than instruction. Now, obviously, to operate on this data, you'll need to load it from memory. And typically, you do that using the load instruction. This takes an offset and adds that offset to the base register, reads the writ specified with Frank tree from memory, and stores it in the destination. So if you want, you could load a single byte. You could load a half word, which would be 16 bits or 2 bytes. And you could load a full word, which is 4 bytes. If you're using a 64-bit base ISA, so RV64I, you'd also have, say, the option to load a double word and load um, 8 bytes at once. Now, if you want to store something, then you would use um, the store instruction. This takes the offset, adds it to the value in base, and then stores the lower, however many specified by bits, bits to that address. Now, there's some more, also some extra instructions that we should address. The um, fence instruction is used to fence memory accesses. This is useful for, say, if you're doing operations out of order, the fence instruction lets you go um, data accesses before this instruction will happen before data accesses after this instruction. And this isn't necessarily guaranteed when you're using, say, out of order processes. The eCall and eBreak instructions, short for environment call and environment break, are used for system calls and breaking. So, say, breakpoints in your code, that's what eBreak is used for. eCall, on the other hand, is used for system calls. So, if you're familiar with, say, the Linux system calls, that's where the eCall instruction would come into play. RISC-V also specifies some hint instructions used to hint for, say, performance hints. These are mainly instructions where, say, the destination is x0, because obviously the results of that will be discarded. There's a table here. A lot of these are reserved for future standard use, but there are still plenty that you can, say, use for your own use. I also alluded to the other base instruction sets earlier, RV32E and RV64I. RV32E is essentially the same as RV32I, except RV32E only has the lower 16 registers. This is useful when you're trying to design an extremely small processor core, because in those, the registers can easily be the majority of the core. So, so only having half the registers easily means you're only using up, say, three quarters of the die space. It's a big saving. RV64i, on the other hand, is essentially RV32i with some extra instructions to operate on 64-bit values, as well as the 64-bit xlearn. As I mentioned with the load and store instructions, and they have the extra bits to operate on double words. So that's a quick introduction to the RISC-V instruction set. And as far as it's not as risky as you think, while it's in nowhere near as wide as operation as x86 and ARM, it is still used by some modern companies. For example, modern NVIDIA GPUs use RISC-V based processors for security. In the, in the graphics cards. Um, in addition, expressive systems make 
um, a microprocessor called the ESP32. And modern ESP32 variants use RISC-V based processors. I believe they are RV32IMC. So that would be RV32I with multiplication and compressed instruction extensions. There are certainly a lot of microcontrollers using RISC-V based instruction sets. And there are even large companies such as Sci-5 building large scale RV64GC desktop processors. RV64G um, is RV64I along with the multiplication, atomics, float, double and double extensions along with all of the other extensions implied by that. I believe these have even been made to run Linux. So it's not like RISC-V um, can't run complex software. It can. It's been made to run Linux. Overall, I hope this has been an interesting summary of what RISC-V is and why it's useful.